welcome everybody this evening to Center Street Church, our evening service. We are so excited that you're joining this long weekend. And hey, what have you been up to this weekend? You've been already out on some adventure. You got something planned for the next couple days. Well, post it in chat. You got something going on or, or text to friends, invite somebody into what you have. But we're so glad that you are here this evening. We're just trusting that you're going to be hearing from God. Greg, we got some exciting things coming up uh, during the service this evening. Yep. Uh, Pastor Mitch and team are leading us in worship. And then Jared and I are going to tell you about some ways you, that we can all connect in community. That's a key thing to be doing in the fall is to, as we start off again into the rhythm of new things this fall, to think how can we be living in community with others. And, uh, and then Pastor Henry's back from his summer break. And so we're back into the Roman series and we're looking at Romans 8. So an awesome passage. So uh, we, we believe this will be a really encouraging and challenging uh, time for you tonight. That's right. So again, so glad that you're here. Drop a post in chat. Uh, check out the information that's in the description on the platform you're joining there just for some helpful links and, and ways to connect. We want to connect with you. We want to hear from you. So let's go to our worship team now at Central Campus. Let's worship the God who is worthy. God bless. We'll see you in a bit. Welcome Center Street Church. Why don't you stand with us as we worship this evening. Uh, if you're here in the room, we're glad you're here. If you're tuning in online, we're so excited you're here as well. And we just pray that this evening's service is just a blessing for you. Come on. Let's worship him tonight. this he's coming on the clouds to sing these words over your circumstance no matter what you're going through he is for you and nothing can stop him come on who can stop the lord almighty who can stop the lord almighty who can stop the lord almighty no one who can stop the lord always oh, sing it over our lives Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can 
miraculous things for us and we want to celebrate this truth together and so our prayer is that God will move powerfully in your lives through the Holy Spirit first John 4 says if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God then God lives in them and they live in God it's such an amazing gift that the God of the universe desires to have a personal relationship with us and we believe that through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice in our behalf we can enter into God's presence. So we worship together and we acknowledge that we stand before the King of glory. Let's sing it out.
we worship you, God. Come on, sing this, church. We bow before. you were, you are, and you will always be holy, and that story will never change, that we can trust you with our lives, that we can devote our time and our attention to you. When we call on your name, you are there. We thank you, Jesus. John 3 and 30 to 31 says this. This is when um, John the Baptist is exalting Jesus, and he says, he must become greater I must become less. That's a word that's been on my heart this week. God, you must increase. I must decrease. We're going to sing about that right now. Will creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to live one cry and from north 
declaration that no matter what comes our way we will stand strong and put him first that we will we will magnify the name of Jesus I invite you to just sing these words and declare it to be true in your circumstance in your situation come on and I won't bow to waters I'll stand strong and worship you and if it puts me I'll rejoice to show they do, and I won't be fooled by feelings. I'll hold fast to what is true, and if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just a doorway into resurrection life, and if I join you in sufferings, then I'll join you in you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing, my song will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified, let His praise arise. Christ 
We just put our hands together for this God who is good. He is faithful. He is holy. What's most incredible of all is that he's pursuing each one of us tonight. He's running after us. He wants us to turn to him, to his goodness and his love and his faithful arms. Amen. Praise God. You may have a seat. Well, we want to welcome you once again to Center Street Church. Uh, those of you who are joining in person, those of you joining online, so great to be uh, here together. We want to especially welcome anyone who is new to Center Street Church. And uh, we would love to hear more about your story and get to know you. And we have a new here area right out in the atrium uh, just to the left. And so we'd love to chat with you there. Those of you joining online as well, connect with our chat hosts. Check the notes section for some helpful links and, and ways to connect because we'd love to uh, connect with you too. You know, these past few weeks, we've been exploring some different ways that you can connect here at Center Street Church. Uh, connecting by uh, learning and growing by joining a class. Uh, connecting by serving in the gifts that God has given you, serving in one of our ministry areas here and, and volunteering. And, and this week, our focus, our theme is community. You know, we were never made to do life alone. We were never made to do life alone. And we believe that walking in community is a critical part of our faith journey, a critical part for us growing in faith and growing in our relationship with God. You know, I've been deeply impacted by walking in community with others. When I made the intentional decision in my early 20s to walk together with, with a group of young adults here at Center Street Church Young Adults, and through my 20s walking with them, and, and when I got married and, and my wife and I uh, had children, uh, we joined together with a, a group of uh, young families. And just walking together through the joys and the challenges of, of that life stage, and it's been such a blessing. And so, Greg, we are passionate about that. We're passionate about joining in community here at Center Street Church. Yeah, and one of the best ways you can do that, and you may have heard about this before but just haven't gone through this, or maybe it's brand new to you if you're new to Center Street, but it's coming to something called Taste and See. Taste and See is a great introduction to what it means to be part of a spiritual family like Jesus did with his disciples, drawing people together and being a spiritual family together that then went on mission, his father's mission to share good news with others. And that's what we're seeking to build in our various community groups and missional communities. So Taste and See, it's about eight weeks. It's a great thing to come to. I encourage you to go on the website and check it out and sign up for that. It, uh, it happens on different nights, at different times, and in different locations. Uh, I think maybe even some will be online this fall. And so find one that works for you to be part of. Just strongly encourage you to do that. Some people who come to that then launch, see that as a launching point to start a new community group or a new missional community and, and to get some experience. So you might want to come as a community group to that and, uh, and then let that launch you into what you have for the fall. So that's a great way to um, get a taste of missional community. Now, there are community groups that exist already, and I'll just list them off here for you. You can check a lot of more information on the website about this, but we have community groups just for men, community groups that are just for women, others that are just for singles, others that are for young adults, others that are for people in our special needs uh, ministry groups and gatherings, others for those age 55 plus. So there are lots of ways uh, to connect in community here already. While I'm on that note, if I can just keep going here. Keep on I'm rolling. On You're roll. on a roll. Greg's on There's a roll. Lot. It's, it's the fall. <laughs> what do you expect, right? Um, lots of stuff is starting up again. So we do have a, a special worship gathering and luncheon here for our adults 55 plus. And so you're welcome to come to that. It's September 21st at 11 a.m. Bring a friend, a neighbor, someone who's looking for a community. So again, another way to connect in community. Information's on the website, or you can call and talk to Celia. Just call during office hours. And do you want me to just keep covering the other events that are coming up? Greg, we got some exciting events coming up. Yes, we I do, don't want to slow down your momentum here, okay? <laughs> so just keep on going. <laughs> All right, the train is moving. So three quick things that are coming up. One is tomorrow night, our night of worship. Even though it's a long weekend, we're still having night of worship. So youth and young adults, yes, come on out tomorrow. Five o'clock is kind of connection time and game time, and then six o'clock is worship time. And then we have our regular rhythm of our prayer night, which is the third Thursday. And so September 15th is the next one here at Central Campus, our regular prayer time and our healing prayer time. And as we launch into this fall, um, it's a, you know, whether you can come here or not, even just during your day, right, take some time, block it out and seek God's face 
saying, Lord, I want to spend time in your presence and I want to hear what you're saying for what you want me and us to anticipate and what he has for us this fall. So consider that um, day of prayer is something, uh, and that night of prayer is something you can connect with. And then lastly, we have a special class coming up called Grandparenting Matters, a six-week class. Starts September 12th at Central Campus. Check out the website for more information about that as well. That's right. I hear grandparenting is just the best stage of life, Greg. I'm not quite there yet, but maybe soon. Who knows? (laughs) Awesome. Well, hey, if you'd like to give to the ministry and mission of Center Street Church, there are many ways to do so. You'll see some of those on the screen. They're also offering drop boxes on your way out of the worship center, giving kiosks in the atrium as well. So thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity partnering together. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, God, for your generosity and the blessings that you have poured out in our life. Father, we thank you for today, this evening, where we can come and worship and and hear from your word. We want to pray for Pastor Henry now as we look into your word, God, the words of eternal life, Jesus, that you have given us. Open our hearts, open our ears, God. We want to hear from you through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to all of you who are joining us online, as well as those of you who are meeting together here at Central Campus. It's, it's good to be with you again and to uh, celebrate God's goodness. Also, I want to uh, welcome those of you who are meeting together at one of our other campuses in Airdrie, in Bearspaw, Bridgeland, and South Calgary. I trust that you've had an enjoyable um, a summer, a restful summer, um, the uh, opportunity to recalibrate and get ready for another year of uh, challenges and opportunities, I'm sure. Well, we're continuing our study in Romans chapter 8, and I'm going to invite you to turn uh, to that chapter right now in your Bibles, um, in your Bible app. And in this chapter, the Apostle Paul gives several principles of what it means to live in Christ or to live in the Spirit. And we've looked at four principles thus far, which I'm going to review very quickly since it's been a a little while since we've been in the book of Romans. First of all, to live in the Spirit means you are no longer motivated by a fear of condemnation, but by a love for God and others. Look at verse 1 and 2. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation because, as we learned in Romans chapter 3 to 5, uh, Christ paid for our sins on the cross, and when we put our faith in him, he becomes one with us, and as a result, in the uh, eternal realm, God sees us as forgiven and righteous. It's called justification, and that is our position or our identity in Christ. Of course, we still live in the earthly realm, the temporary realm, and therefore we still have a lot of growing to do, which is called sanctification. And that is the theme of chapters 6 to 8 how to grow in our relationship with Christ. But in the eternal realm, we are forgiven and righteous in the sight of our God and therefore are no longer motivated by a fear of condemnation. Secondly, to live in the Spirit means you do not set your mind on the temporary things of life, but on the eternal things of God. Look at verse 5. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Setting your mind on something means that's what you take your cues from in life. 
It's what you're thinking about most of the time. It's what matters to you the most, what you value the most, what it is that um, causes your adrenaline to flow. And then thirdly, in verse 9 to 11, it teaches that living in the Spirit means I live in total dependence on Jesus Christ rather than on my own ability to live a God-pleasing life. See, when you embrace Christ as your Lord and Savior, you receive the Holy Spirit in your life, which means the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in you. And He will live the life of Jesus through you. However, the Spirit is a gentleman. He won't force Himself on you and if you want to experience, therefore, a life over sin and live the full life that God wants you to live, then you will need to yield control of your life to Him. In a sense, you're going to have to let Him do the driving. In the same way that Jesus lived in total dependence on His Heavenly Father when He was on earth. Which brings us to the fourth principle. Living in the Spirit means you are convinced God will use all things that you surrender to Him to accomplish His good purposes in your life. Look at verse 28. Of course, one of the favorite verses in all the Bible. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Now, we fleshed this all out last time. But I want you to notice again that this verse does not say that all things are good. No, there's a lot of bad things in this world. There's a lot of things that happen to us that are not good and should not be celebrated. Neither does this passage teach that everything will turn out okay for us in this life. It says God will work out everything for our ultimate good, which we may or may not see evidence of in this life. See, you can't accurately interpret and understand verse 28 without including verse 29 because it tells us what God's good purpose is for us. Look at verse 29 and 30. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Well, let's look at that a little closer. God writes, I mean, Paul writes, God foreknew us. In other words, from the beginning of time, God foreknew that you would be alive today. He created you. He called you by name, and he said, I want you to be my child. I want to spend forever with you. He knew you were going to be saved by his grace. But he didn't just foreknow you and leave it at that. No, Paul goes on to say in verse 30 that he called us to himself. In other words, he reveals himself to us to try to get our attention. So how does he do that? Well, multiple ways. He does it or attempts to do it through his creation, through the birth of a child. He tries to get our attention through the scriptures or perhaps through the life and testimony of another Christian. Or perhaps he tries to get our attention through circumstances and spiritual encounters with him, all for the purpose of us opening our minds and our hearts to his reality and to his grace and also to his love and his plans for our lives. He pours out his grace on us and he begins to draw us to himself. When we respond to his call or his grace by faith, Paul says God justifies us, meaning in the eternal realm, remember we live in two realms, the earthly realm and the eternal realm. In the eternal realm, 
we are forgiven, we're cleansed, and we're given a position before him of being loved, accepted, and endeared. And when God justifies us, we can be confident that he will also glorify us. In other words, he will take us to heaven. When we get to heaven, we're going to be glorified by the Lord, which means there'll be no more sin, and we're going to be made perfect in soul and body. We're going to receive a body that's made for an eternal existence in the same way that our spirit, which is in Christ, is perfect in the sight of God right now in the eternal realm. What an incredible day that's going to be when God glorifies us in heaven. Now, let's go back to verse 29 and talk about this explosive word, predestined. The word predestined means to determine beforehand. So is this verse saying, as some people believe, that God determines people's eternal destination beforehand? That some people will go to heaven and others will go to hell and really not have a choice in the matter? Well, 2 Peter 3.9 makes it very clear that God does not want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance, which dispels this notion that God predestines people to go to hell or to heaven. That is not his will at all. However, to be clear, some people will flat out reject him. And they will get exactly what they wanted. And that is to be eternally separated from God, which sadly will be in hell. But here's the thing. The word predestination or predestined is always for believers only. It is never used in reference to unbelievers. So its focus is not on heaven or hell. And so what is verse 29 teaching? Well, look at it again. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn, that meaning Jesus would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now notice Paul writes that God predestined those who love him for a purpose. In other words, we've been predestined for a purpose. So what is God's good purpose for those who love him? Well, that they would be conformed into the image of his son. In other words, the good purpose that God wants to perform in your life and my life is that we'd be like Jesus. That's it. Jesus is the prototype, as it were. Paul writes in verse 29 that he is, that Jesus is the first fruit of what we will become if we daily live in humble dependence on his enabling grace. Now, what that means practically is that even though God may not be the cause, he will use everything that happens to us, both good and bad, The celebrations, the victories, the achievements, the pain, the heartache, the the tears, the disabilities, the disappointments, even the seasons of boredom and loneliness. He'll use it all to accomplish his one overarching purpose in our lives. And that is to mold you and me into the image of Christ, to be more like Jesus. Now sometimes we will see his good purpose being accomplished in us and through us in this life. The way the patriarch Joseph did in his life, remember? In one day he went from the prison to the palace and became the prime minister of Egypt. It's very clear God had prepared him for 13 years for what he wanted wanted him to do when he hit the palace. But even if we don't see what God is accomplishing in us, in this life. The way nothing seemed to make sense, for example, in the prophet Jeremiah's life. On the basis of Romans 8, verse 18, and also verse 28, we have the assurance that one day in glory, 
we will see what good purpose God accomplished in us. And when we see it, we will not only understand, but we will worship him. Johnny Erickson Tata. She was paralyzed as a teenager in a diving accident and has now lived as a quadriplegic for more than 70 years. Hard to believe that. She was here about five to six years ago and, and shared her story with us. And she wrote this, When I get to heaven, I am going to push my wheelchair to the throne of Jesus. Notice I'll be walking. I'm going to thank him for every character refining work he did in me and through me, which he did. He impacted millions of, she, he impacted millions of people through her. I'm going to thank him for every character refining work he did in me and through me because of this wheelchair. And then I'm going to ask Jesus to send this wheelchair to hell because it was only needed and only relevant because of the wreckage of sin in this life. You know, a lot of us say that we live by faith. But the moment we can't see or understand what God's doing, we, we kind of throw up our hands. And I've even done this. And we, we say, you know, God, are you even here? God, do you even know what I'm going through? I mean, do you even care? We say we want to live by faith, but we also want to understand why bad things happen to us. But you see, that's not walking by faith. That's walking by sight. Faith means trusting God even when we can't see Him. Even when we don't understand. Even when nothing makes sense. Faith means waiting patiently until that time, either in this life or the next, when we understand and we see clearly that it was all about, it was all about becoming more like Jesus. It was for all those reasons, it was for that reason that God did the things that he did. It was for that reason that God used all things, the good, the bad, even the ugly, for our ultimate good and for his ultimate glory. Now, I don't want to minimize pain and suffering in any way. I've gone through a share of it myself. It's not an easy road to be on. But you see, one implication of this teaching is that not one second of our suffering or disappointment is wasted. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And John Piper has said this, Not only is all your affliction momentary, not only is it light in comparison to eternity and the weight of glory there, but every second of it is totally meaningful. Every millisecond of your misery in the path of obedience is producing a peculiar glory that you will get because of that suffering. I don't care if it was cancer or criticism, slander or sickness. It wasn't meaningless. It's doing something. Therefore, whatever you may be facing... Don't lose heart. But take these truths here from Romans 8, especially the ones that we're looking at in this particular message. Take those truths and preach them to yourself daily until your heart begins to sing with the confidence that God is for you and not against you. Verse 26 tells us the Spirit is praying the will of God perfectly over us, that God's good purpose will be accomplished 
in our lives. Verse 34 tells us that Jesus is interceding for us. Even if we don't pray perfectly, because a lot of us don't pray because we feel like we don't pray perfectly. Or even if you, you think you, maybe you're not praying in the will of God, or that your life isn't where it should be with God, we can know that the Spirit and Jesus are praying for us. Yes, we need to pray for one another. But even if our faith is weak, even if, if we pray incorrectly, we know that the Holy Spirit and Jesus are interceding for us. And that leads to the fifth and the final principle of what it means to live in the Spirit. Living in the Spirit or in Christ means that I live every day with the unshakable confidence that God is for me and not against me. Look at verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Let me ask you, do you live your Christian life believing that God's for you and not against you? Your ability to live in the Spirit depends on what your mindset and your attitude is with regard to whether you believe God's for you or against you. As you go throughout your day and you're hit with a disappointment or a hardship, do you, do you find yourself thinking, I don't know what this is all about, but I believe that God is for me. I believe there's a good reason for this. Or do you find yourself thinking immediately, oh no, this is happening because God's upset with me. You know, he's punishing me. Paul says, you'll never live in victory. You'll never know what it means to live in the Spirit unless you have an unshakable confidence that God is for you and not against you. Now that means we're going to have to live by faith and not by sight. Living by faith means you choose to see everything that happens to you, the good and the bad, from God's eternal perspective rather than from your limited earthly perspective. Now the reality is these things are easily said but they're not always easily lived. There's many times I wish I could live as easily the things that sometimes I say. And Paul understands that. And in the remaining verses of chapter 8, he's like a lawyer, and he wraps up his closing arguments. He presents a powerful case to convince us that God is for us and that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of God. In his mind, he remembers the issues, the doubts that people raised, that he interacted with that can get in the way of us living in the Spirit. And so, even though he's addressed every one of these issues earlier in the book of Romans, he repeats them. He summarizes them, one at a time. And in so doing, he spells out what it means to live in the Spirit when we are overwhelmed with doubt or fear or both. First of all, living in the Spirit means I have an unshakable confidence in God's power and protection. In verse 31, Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? You know, when our boys were young, elementary age, one afternoon, all four of them charged into our front door, not into it, but through it, kind of almost fell into the front part of our home. And they were yelling, Dad, Dad, can you please come here? Hurry, hurry. I was downstairs and I just bolted up those stairs concerned that someone was badly hurt. Well, thankfully, nobody was hurt. But the reason they raced home was because a teenager about twice their size had, who undoubtedly they had upset in some way chased after them, likely with the intent of laying a little bruising on them. 
And he came right into our yard. But when I stepped outside and asked him, you know, is there a problem? He quickly turned and walked away. But you see, our boys raced home and called for me because, because they felt safe and secure around me. See, at that time, my boys had this misguided notion that I was the strongest man alive. Maybe even the smartest man alive. In fact, I recall overhearing them at times saying to one of their friends, oh, my dad can whoop your dad. Now, that didn't last very long. But I thoroughly enjoyed that season of parenting. I mean, what parent doesn't like their kids thinking they're omnipotent? Let's face it. Parenting comes, becomes much harder the day that your kids realize how weak and flawed you really are. But the bottom line is, for a season, a very short season, any time that I was around them, they felt safe. Not because they, you know, there, was, they, there wasn't any danger, but because they assumed their dad was bigger and stronger than the dangers that they faced. They believed it was that if dad was for them and if dad was with them, who or what could be against them? And this is what Paul is saying here. If Almighty God, the creator of the universe, who knows us, who loves us, and who in Christ died for us, if he is for us, why are we sweating the small stuff? Why are we sweating over those things or those uh, uh, forces or whatever that we believe is against us? Why are we losing sleep? Why are we filled with fear and anxiety about our future? Now, Paul is not saying here that no one will ever oppose us. I mean, I'm sure many of you are facing all kinds of opposition, like a bad boss or an addiction a health issue, a troubled marriage, difficult kids. Some of you are very concerned over how the media and the educational system are impacting your children and youth. Others of you are really struggling with the cultural forces and the, the government legislation that seems intent on taking away rights and freedoms that are, are near and dear to us. And many are fearful of what the future holds for them and their children. The question is, do we honestly believe, I mean, do we have an unshakable confidence that our God is greater than what it is that concerns us today? You know, friends, even if everything seems out of control, Christ followers who are living in the Spirit do not cave into fear or try to isolate themselves or protect themselves from all the potential dangers. No, they believe that our powerful God is the one who is in control and that they can totally trust Him even when it seems dark clouds surround them. Christ followers who live in the Spirit believe to the core of their being that if God is for us, we need not fear anything or anyone that is against us. We can keep our eyes on Him and continue to follow Him with all of our hearts. And so first of all, Living in the Spirit means I have an unshakable confidence in God's power and protection. Secondly, living in the Spirit means I have an unshakable confidence in God's provision. You know, let's face it. We often wonder whether God will provide everything we need. I mean, don't we all find ourselves at times thinking about certain scenarios that we play out in our minds, especially the negative scenarios of what could happen to us or to those that we love if they were to have a, a life-changing medical prognosis or a life-changing injury or even, 
you know, a significant failure or loss of employment? And Paul answers and says in verse 32, he, referring to God, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Paul writes, if, if God gave up his son to die for all of us on the cross in order to receive the greatest gift we could possibly receive, which is our spiritual need to be in right relationship with God, why would he now not provide us with the things that we need to do what he calls us to do? I mean, for example, if someone thinks enough of you to give you a costly watch, a, a Rolex, do you think that that person will object when you ask them for the box that goes with it? If a mother is willing to give up her baby for adoption, do you think she will object if you ask to take the baby's clothes as well? It is no different in the spiritual realm. If God has already given us the most priceless and costly gift of his son, do you really think that God's going to withhold anything else that we need to live for him? Now notice I said what we need. Not what we want, but what we need. Church, God is for you. He doesn't just want to save you from your sins, but he wants to bless you. He wants you to experience life to the full and therefore will provide what you need to live for him. And please note this. If he doesn't provide your wants, you must trust him that he has a good reason, that he has your best interests at heart. Watch your heart. If you don't get what you want, don't get bitter at God, don't get mad at other people because he never promised to meet all of your wants. He promised to meet all of your needs. And then thirdly, living in the Spirit means I have an unshakable confidence in God's pardon. I often hear people say, I know God loves me, but... There's always that word, B-U-T, but I don't think he totally accepts me. I still think there are times that he's ticked at me. My observation is that one of the greatest struggles Christians have is believing that they are loved, accepted, and totally forgiven by the Lord. This never-ending struggle reminds me of a story that Bob George tells about a man named Stuart. Stuart was responsible for the death of an 18-year-old of, of 18-year-old Susan in an auto, auto accident. Stuart was drunk, and he plowed into her car on a New Year's morning, killing her instantly. He was convicted of manslaughter for drunken driving, and on top of his criminal record, Susan's family filled a civil, filed a civil lawsuit against him, and they won. But they requested an unusual and creative judgment. Though they had originally um, sued Stewart for $1.5 million, they settled for $936. However, those $936 were to be paid in a specific way. Each Friday, and that was the day that Susan died, Stuart was to make out a check in her name for $1 and mail it to the family. The $936 were to be paid $1 per week for 18 years, one for each week of Susan's life. Susan's family wanted Stuart to remember what he had done. At first, Stuart was relieved. But with each passing week, this required ritual began to wear on him to the point of depression. 
Because every Friday, he was reminded again that he was responsible for that young woman's death. Writing her name on the check became more and more painful until he stopped writing them. The family went back to court to force him to continue. Four times over the next eight years, Stuart stopped paying and was forced to start over again by court order. And finally, testifying that he was haunted by her death and tormented by the payments, Stuart went to court himself to appeal the cruel punishment that had been levied on him. In court, he offered Susan's family two boxes of checks covering the payments for the remainder of the 18 years plus an extra year. The family refused. Now, church, this story is a picture of the struggle many Christians have within themselves in their relationship with God. I don't want to minimize the crime that Stuart committed or the deep hurt that Susan's family suffered. It's an awful thing that he did, and there is something in all of us that says he deserves to pay for what he did the rest of his life. But this is not the issue I want to address in this message. What I want to look at is what life without grace looks like. As long as Steward is required to remember his crime and to continue to pay a weekly debt to Susan's family, what do you think the chances are that he will ever live a normal, healthy, and productive life? Not much of a chance, as far as I'm concerned. What do you think the chances are that he could ever develop a positive relationship with Susan's family? None. Zippo. He'll want to stay a million miles away from that family. To what extent do you think this would affect his ability to relate to other people? You see, you cannot enjoy a close relationship with someone when guilt and condemnation stands between you. Now, here's the thing. Many people do not grow in their relationship with the Lord for the same reason. They are dealing with God on the same basis as Stuart is with Susan's family. They believe that there's still unpaid debt between them and God and that he must therefore be angry with them. And as a result, they sort of avoid God. Well, if you've been following with us in our study of Romans 6 to 8, you know that Paul says, it ain't so. You know that Paul says, unless you embrace by faith and rest in the truth, that in the eternal realm you are forgiven and justified because Jesus paid for it all, you're going to be so burdened trying to pay off your debt or to atone for your sins that you will never experience the power and the joy of the resurrection and enjoy a personal relationship with Jesus. Your focus is going to be all in the wrong place. You see, under the Old Covenant, which was written to Israel, for Israel, forgiveness was offered on an up-to-date basis. That's why the sacrifices had to be repeated endlessly. Like Stuart's dollar-a-week payment, the Old Testament worshipers had to make continual offerings for their guilt. Yes, the past was washed clean, but there was always tomorrow. Nowhere in the Old Covenant do you find a sacrifice that offers cleansing for tomorrow's sins as well. 
That is until Jesus came. And he did it all. Look at what Hebrews 10.11 says. Day after day, every old covenant priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest, that's referring to Christ, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he didn't need to stand anymore. He sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus Christ has dealt with sins once and for all. While the Old Testament priests are standing continually offering sacrifices, Jesus is seated. Why? Because the work is done. He paid for it all on the cross. Now I share all that background to say this. Satan will try to accuse you and other people may try to condemn you. But Jesus is the one who has justified you. He's the one who loves you with an everlasting love and he totally accepts you. Even though you will still sin, you're still going to make mistakes in life, which by the way, for your own spiritual health, you should acknowledge and confess to the Lord but the judgment of those sins has already been paid for by Christ. You don't have to write any $1 checks anymore, so to speak, in Stuart's case. Jesus paid for the price in full. And so in the eternal realm, you are forgiven, righteous, and complete in Christ. And that's why in verse 33 and 34, here in Romans 8, Paul asks rhetorically, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen. It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Paul's argument is that no prosecution can succeed because through Christ, our sin has already uh, been judged the penalty has been paid in full and all charges have been dropped so who can accuse us in fact the judge is the one who died for us Paul says if you feel condemned it isn't from God God justified you in Christ he is for you and so reasons, Paul. If you're sure that God has accepted you, why would you be concerned about anyone else's approval? Now sadly, you know, some people believe the only way that they have worth is when they reach some standard of excellence. When people look to them and admire them for some kind of success, for some kind of achievement. And that standard is usually based on how they compare with other people. And so in order to be worthy, they believe that they have to reach a level of success, obtain a moral standard, and or be a certain kind of person or be successful in some area. And if they don't obtain that standard, they have no worth. But you see, all through Romans, one of the things that the Apostle Paul has taught is that your worth is not based on what you do. It is not based on how good you are. You have worth because of what God says about you. As one commentator put it, your identity is established by what 
the most important person in your life thinks about you. I want you to hear that again. Your identity is based on what the most important person in your life says about you. And you see, that's where we go astray because if that person is you, or if that person is someone else, someone whose approval and opinion you know, you live for, then you're always going to struggle with feelings of guilt and disapproval no matter what God says or what God has done for you. Make no mistake, you will never live in freedom until you establish Jesus as the most important person in your life and surrender your life completely to him and declare in faith the words of the songwriter, I am who you say I am. Which leads us to the final truth that Paul gives here. Living in the Spirit means I have an unshakable confidence in God's presence. Look at verse 35. Paul writes, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Now we know that Paul experienced all of these hardships and sufferings. He even quotes Psalm 44 where the psalmist laments Israel's defeat at the hands of pagan nations. And, And the psalmist wonders if God's forsaken them, given up on them. And Paul dispels that here in Romans 8. Essentially, he says, if God didn't turn his back on us when we turned our back on him, why would he turn his back on us now? And he goes on to declare in verse 37, and I'm just going to have you stand, and I want you to read this. I want you to read this from the heart. The way that I can envision Paul saying this at the end of his discourse. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can you say amen to that? Thank you, Lord. Now that's worship because it's based on the truth. You may be seated. We are conquerors, more than conquerors, friends, because regardless of what we may be facing, there is a person, there is no person, there is no circumstance that can separate us from the love and the presence of Christ. Friends, we are who God says we are, the one who saved us and is greater than the one who opposes us. And therefore, we are more than conquerors. Now I'm going to close with this. John Chrysostom, he lived in the 4th century, the latter half of the 4th century. And he earned the nickname Golden Mouth because of his eloquent speech and his eloquent sermons, which impacted many people for Christ. And this got him in trouble with the Roman authorities. And so he was hauled before the Roman emperor. And the Roman emperor looked at him and threatened him to exile him if he remained a Christian. And John responded saying, well, you really can't exile me because you see, the whole world is my father's house. The emperor said, well then, I'll have you killed. And again, John said, well, you can't really do that either, for my life is hid with Christ in God. The emperor said, well, okay, then I will take away your treasures, your possessions, all that you have. And again, John said, well, 
you can't really do that either for my treasure is in heaven. Well, then I'll drive you away from everyone that you know and you will have no friends left. And John said, well, can't do that either for I have a friend in heaven for whom I, I cannot be separated. And John said, you know, I defy you. I do not fear you, sir. For there is nothing that you can do to hurt me. And what's he really saying? No one. No one. Not the emperor. Not our greatest enemy. Can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And in the end, if you think about it, that's really all that really matters. Fellow believer, in Christ, we are more than conquerors over what concerns us today. You are greater than your situation in life. Your life is not defined by your circumstances, as hard as they may be. Your life is defined by who you are in Jesus Christ. You are who He says you are. And if that's true, who is there who can condemn you? Who is there that can discourage you or disrespect you or even marginalize you? And what is there to fear or worry? Regardless of what you are facing in life, remember that inner peace and contentment is found not in what you feel, but in what you know. You may not know how it's all going to turn out, but you know the God who will work it out for your ultimate good and for his ultimate glory. And the God we know is not only Lord God Almighty, but the God who loves us with an everlasting love, the God who is for us. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? And friend, I ask you, what battle do you face week in and week out? What situation is causing you to be discouraged and defeated? Making you feel you just can't go on anymore. God wants to use that situation for your ultimate good. Not only to grow your faith, but to make you more like Jesus. He will empower you and he will give you the strength not only to endure, but to conquer, to live victoriously, even while facing the greatest challenges in life. But it will require you to get off, get your eyes off your circumstances, and to get out there on the limb and trust Him, and surrendering your life and the outcome to him. So take a moment now and ask, Lord, what are you saying to me? What are you asking me to do about it? What's the next step you want me to take?
was lost, but he brought me in his love for me. Oh, his love for me. When the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. I'm the child of God, yes, I am. not forsaken, that we are who he says we are, we're not who culture says we are, we're not who our friend says we are, but we are his, declare that truth over your life. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the truth packed into Romans and the power of the gospel. Thank you that you are for us.
Thank you for those, these anointed words you inspired Paul to write. That we can have an unshakable confidence in your power and protection, in your provision, your pardon, and also your presence. Thank you for the reminder that you know what we're going through right now. That you care and that you hurt when we hurt. And thank you for the assurance that you, Jesus, and Holy Spirit are praying for us according to the Father's will. Even though we recognize we may not always understand your ways, we may not always understand your will, we do ask that you would accomplish your good purposes in our life through it. And we humbly ask, Lord, as you have, have really called upon us to, that you would meet our need, that you would answer our prayers for restoration and re resolution or for healing, and that you would do it, Lord, in your time and your way. In the meantime, we pray, Lord, that you would change us. Do the work you want to do in our life. Grow our faith, I pray, and give us the courage to listen to your voice and to step out and do what you're calling us to do. For we pray it all in the precious name of Jesus. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his precious peace. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Prayer partners are making their way up here. If you have, if you have a burden that you would like someone to pray with you about, if you have questions, if there's anything at all that we can pray for you, we'd love to pray with you. And God be with you as you go. Well, what struck you from that uh, passage in Romans 8? What's God highlighting for you? I think one of the things that really jumped out to me is just that Jesus isn't just my forgiver, the one who died for me, but he's also the one who's my brother, right? He's the one that intercedes for me. He's the one that empowers me. That's why in all these things, the challenging things of my life, I can be more than a conqueror in him because of all that he's doing in me and for me. There's just lots to dig into and unpack. So I want to meditate on that and see myself more as primarily a beloved child of God and brother of Jesus who gets to live with him and in him. Yeah, that's right. Thanks for sharing that, Greg. There's so much in Romans 8 that we can be taking and, and meditating on like Greg was saying. So, you know, whatever jumped out at you, we just want to encourage you, just like Greg was sharing, you know, turn to somebody that you're viewing with or, or yeah. call up a friend or text somebody or send somebody the link. Um, we just want to continue to, to press into what God is saying to us. And as Pastor Henry always says, and what he's calling us to do about it. So we want to encourage you, if you're not caught up with our Romans sermon series, you can catch that on our YouTube channel, on our website, and just watch some of those sermons, you know, and, and even our Exodus series over the summer. There's just so much that God is wanting to speak to us through his word. So this week, as you go, be blessed. And before you, before you leave, if you want someone to pray with you, we have our chat hosts available. You can call the church during the week for prayer to speak to the pastor of the day. We'd love to connect with you. And remember, this week's theme is connecting in community. So check the website. Check the notes in uh, the section that you're, uh, that you're joining on, the platform you're joining on, because we'd love to have you connected as well. So God bless you this week as you go. Stay connected. We'll see you next time.